Well, guys, good morning. I wouldn't even have to teach today. God has already showed up in this place, and what an incredible morning it's been so far. So good. He's good to us. Well, guys, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go ahead and open up with me to the book of Romans, chapter 7. Romans 7. The title of today's message is The Battle Within. Every one of us have a struggle that we deal with that takes place on the inside. And you can come into church, look at the people sitting around you next to you, and their, their makeup's done, they're dressed nice, they look like everything's got it, is going on. They got it going on in their lives. But the truth is, regardless of how you look on the outside, you can be struggling on the inside. And I was reading Romans chapter 7 this week, and it was just so encouraging to me because Paul, he's, he's just being so honest, he's real. Paul's writing to a group of Christians in Rome, and, and he's talking to them about his own struggles. And I love it when people, people keep it real, because one of the problems with being around Christians too much is that we can, we can tend to start to fake it, you know, tend to start to act like we got it together. We think, you know, well, I'm a Christian. I can't act that way. I can't talk that way. I can't, I, I can't live that way. I've, I'm redeemed, so I've got to get it together. You know, I've got I to gotta fake it. I've got to be someone else. So there are those of you in this room that on the drive here, you were screaming at your kids, stop touching your sister, and then you pull in the church parking lot and like, put a smile on your face, people are going to see if they know who we are here. Like, you're cussing out your kids, you're walking in here like, Jesus is good, God bless you today. It's like, we, feel like, we feel like because we have a relationship with God and we're around other Christians that we got to fake it sometimes and like act like we've got it all together and Paul doesn't mess with that at all. He's like, no, I've got struggles. Like I love Jesus, I love God, but I am confused by my own struggles. So today I want to talk to those of you in this room that you'd say, yeah, I got struggles. I'm sick of faking it. I'm sick of acting like I've got it all together because it seems like though I might look like I'm okay on the outside, there is a true battle going on in my mind right now inside me. Paul starts talking in Romans chapter 7 verse 15. He says this, I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right but I don't do it. Instead I do what I hate. But if I know what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So he's, he's kind of having this, this struggle, this argument with himself. He's going, I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. But, but I know that. I, I know that it's, it's wrong. So I believe that I should be making changes. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does. Verse 18. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I, want, uh, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if, I don't, uh, but if I do what I don't want to do, I'm really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. See, I have discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, that's a good scripture, isn't it? I lay in bed thinking about this scripture because I have the same struggle. It's like, Paul's sitting here, he's going, I'm so confused by myself because there are things I do, I know I shouldn't do them. They're sin, they're bad. And, and I do them and they make my life worse and I have regrets. So I say, I'm not going to do those things anymore. And then inevitably I end up doing those very things I said I wasn't going to do. And on the flip side of it, I say there's things I should do. They're good things. I, I should get up and pray, pray and read my Bible. I should worship. I should tithe. I should serve. I should do all these things, Paul says. But, but those are the things he goes, even though I agree that they're right, I don't end up doing those things. He goes, I don't understand myself. Have you ever felt that way? I pray sometimes. I'm like, God, something is wrong with me. I, I want to do what's right, but I just, I'm just so messed up. Would you pray with me before we jump into this today? 
God, I believe that you've set an atmosphere for this passage today. I believe that in this room there's going to be breakthrough, that there's going to be change, that God, you're ushering in the new season right now, that you are going to free us from the struggles that we've been dealing with on this battle on the inside. But Lord, we know that it's not going to happen if we're just trying to do this on our own. We need you. So Jesus, in your precious name, we invite your Holy Spirit to come into this place to, to speak through me, to speak through your scripture today, and God, that, God, we would be changed before we leave this place. And it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've ever felt like Paul, but I certainly have. There have been times in my life I've, I've seen mistakes that I've been making, and I've just said, I'm going to make a commitment, I'm going to change. Those of you that knew me several years back, maybe like 10 years back, you knew that um, I had a flash temper, and people who were close to me, uh, my, some of my closest friends and family, they would joke with me, and they would call me volatile, <laughs> and say, watch out for Dan, he's volatile today, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, and I would, I would just, I would jump to an argument, I would jump to anger so quickly, and I recognized that, you know, being a pastor, that doesn't really work out, because you can't road rage on Thursday, and chew someone out on the road on Thursday, and then teach them on Sunday, it doesn't work, you know. So I, I just decided, like, I'm going to make a commitment. As of this day, I am no longer going to road rage. I am no longer going get, to get angry. I'm done with that. That's something from the past. So I made a commitment, and I got up in the morning. I said, today, I am not going to scream at a single person in traffic. I'm not going to get in a fight or anything. So I'm driving down the road, and people are cutting me off, and I'm reading bumper stickers, and I'm getting mad, you know? And I'm just thinking, oh, don't get mad today, you know, but I made it through a whole day. I, like, I was screaming on the inside, but nothing came out, you know? So I was very proud of myself. Day two, another day of success, but, but it was like my fuse was getting shorter and shorter and shorter until finally it happened on day three. My wife and I were going to the mall, and we pulled into that, that road that's got two, two lanes going one direction, two lanes the other direction that circles all the way around the mall. And there, I pull up behind the car, and there's an old man that's not in the right lane. He's not in the left lane. He's right in the middle of both lanes, and he's got his right blinker on, and he's going 10 miles an hour. And I pull up behind him, and I tell, him, tell myself, oh, take a deep breath. You're going to be okay. You're fine. And I can see we're going to Target. We come around the corner. I can see Target right there. You know, I can, I can almost there. And I look back forward, and the guy's all over the road. And he's still turning right. There's nowhere to turn right, but he's still turning right, you know. And I, I'm looking at him. I'm make it. And finally, I snap. And I'm like, I can't do it anymore. And I floor it, and I swing around the guy. I turn my blinker on. I turn left into Target, whip into a parking space. It's like, as I'm getting out of the car, I see this old man's car pull up and he hits the brakes, rolls down the window and says, Sonny, you cut me off. <laughs> now guys, I don't know what happened next, okay? I just know that when I came to, I was standing in the middle of the parking lot right next to this old man's car, screaming at him, going, oh, you think you're right, huh? If you want to dance, old man, get out of the car, let's dance. I was ready to rock. I'm thinking, I'm protecting my family. I'm the man here. You ain't going to treat me like this. I look back at my wife, and she's giving me that look. Men, if you're, you're married, your wife has given you this look before. She's looking at me. I'm thinking, I'm the man here. She's going to be so proud of me. She's looking at me like, what is wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? She's like, I married a child. And I look back. I see the handicapped placard swinging in his mirror, and it makes me go, what am I doing? Like, I made a commitment, like, three days ago, I was done with this. No more road rage, no more freaking out. And, like, I'm now in one of my most embarrassing spots because I'm, I, I'm worse now than I was three days ago. I'm trying to pick a fight with an old man in Target, <laughs> like... You might look at me and go, you're crazy, what's wrong with you? But I think we all have those struggles where we say, you know what, I, I'm just, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm not going to mess up that way anymore. So what I did at the end of this day is I said, yeah, I'm, I just got to try harder. I, I can't be successful at what I'm doing in life. I can't, I can't be a pastor, you know. I can't, I, I can't be a good father. I can't be a good husband if I'm letting this anger and this sin take control. So I, I'm going to try harder. And I made a commitment today, that day, that every day from now on, my, I'm not going to be angry anymore. 
Just fast forward a couple years, my, my wife and I went through a really tough struggle in our marriage, and I don't want to get into the details with it, but with our kids and, and just some personal stuff we had going on, there was a difficulty that we faced. And someone who was very dear to our family, a lifelong friend, um, found out what was going on, and she gave my wife a present, and it was a little bracelet. And on the bracelet was um, the verse Zechariah 4, uh, 4 6 was inscribed on it. Zechariah 4 6 is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Almighty. And we read that scripture and I, I, I had to think about it a little bit. She explained to us, I'm giving you this because the difficulty that you're going through right now, sometimes you're going to face difficulties in life that you can't just be tough enough to get through. You're not powerful enough. You can't might your way through it. But the only way you're going to make it through this struggle is by clinging to God and by his spirit, by the strength he gives you. That's going to be the only way you succeed, and, and it meant so much to us, and it ministered to us in that time, but as I continued to struggle daily with the sins that I deal with, as I continued to struggle daily with anger, all of a sudden one day, that verse popped back up into my mind. I thought, maybe, maybe there's a clue here of what God's trying to tell us, that this isn't just about a difficulty that Amelie and I went through, but maybe that this verse, Zechariah 4, 6, could be a life principle for me because I am trying so hard. I, I'm, trying, like, I'm trying to might through this. I'm trying to power through this, and I'm not getting anywhere. In fact, I'm getting worse and worse and worse, and I began applying this verse to my own life, thinking, you know, Instead of trying to be tough enough today to not get angry, to not sin, to not mess up, instead of trying to power through it, what if I just started leaning on God this and going, God, I'm really mad at this guy right now. I don't like his bumper stickers. You know, could, can you help me? And trying to change my focus just a little bit. Thing is, as guys, especially for the men in this room, we, we, we have a tendency to think, you know, I, it's my problem, it's no one else's problem, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep this on the inside, I'm gonna stuff it, I'm gonna get through this just fine on my own, it's not gonna affect anyone else. But the truth is, God says, that, that's not the way I made you. See, I didn't make you where you could power through it on your own. I didn't make you where you could just use your might and your strength to get through it on your own. I made you to have to rely on me so it is going to affect you and it is going to affect other people if you keep just trying by your own strength to change yourself. That's not, that's not how it works. So we go through life and we, we think if I can just get control of this sin issue, if I can stop this, then somehow my life is going to be better. I'll be more proud of myself. I'm going to be more effective in different areas. And Paul is talking to the group of people in Rome. He's saying, I deal with the same struggle. I, I don't understand. I, I want to live a better life, but I fail over and over and over again. And then we see in the same heart and attitude, Paul writes another letter to a group of people in, in in the book of Galatians, Galatians 5.16, it's a different group of people. It's talking about the same thing. He says this, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Read that one more time. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Guys, we get this backwards. Because what we tend to do is we think, you know what, if I, if I stop sinning, that's going to be what, what gratifies the Spirit. If I stop sinning, then God's going to be pleased with me. If I could just get this sin under control, if I could stop looking at those websites, if I could stop drinking so much, if I could stop looking at people that way and, and, and being jealous or angry, if I could stop that, somehow God's going to be happy with me. And Paul's saying, you got it so wrong, and I've had this struggle, and you need to learn and take it from me. And, and in a fatherly voice, he's saying to them, guys, you got to understand, you can't go through life focusing on trying not to sin to please God. In fact, it's the opposite. The only way that you're going to go through life and start to overcome some of those sins, some of those temptations, is by focusing on pleasing the Spirit. By focusing on the closer I get to God today, the more time I spend with him, the more I fall in love with him, the more I know him, the more he knows me, the more intimate we become, then it's like that starves our sinful nature. It starves our desires to do wrong. And, and, and we, it's, it's like a complete reversal. 
See, we go through life trying to get rid of the sin. It's kind of like the way light and dark works. If we were to turn off all the rooms in this, uh, all the lights in this room, and it become pitch black in here, uh, there would be no way to get the darkness out of out of the room on its own. You couldn't take a shovel and shovel the darkness out. What you have to do is you have to introduce light. You bring one light into this room. If it was pitch black in here and one person lit a candle, we would all be able to see. The way you get rid of darkness is to introduce light. You see, so many of us go through life and we just think, if I can just shovel this sin out, if I could get this problem away from me, then that, that's going to be how I fix the problem of darkness. But, but Scripture tells us, no, it works a different way. The way you get rid of darkness is you introduce the light of Jesus to your situation. And you do it daily. You come back every day and introduce the fact that, that, that Jesus is the light. And in the midst of his presence, the darkness, the sin in our lives begins to fade away. It disappears. We spend way too much time focusing on trying not to sin. I've told you guys this story before, but it's the story of when I learned how to ride a bicycle. My father um, took me to a church parking lot in Texas. We, we lived in Fort Worth, Texas at the time, and this church parking lot was huge. It was like the size of two baseball fields. And he, he, he drove me up there, and he was in his little sports car that he loved so much, his little hatchback. And in fact, this was, this was a car he was so proud of. It was a Datsun 280Z. You guys remember what that car was? It's like total midlife crisis car, you know? I could just, I, every time I see one of those, I can just look back and think of my father with his shirt open, some chest hair sticking out, gold chain, you know? It was the, the perfect car for him at the time. And, and I remember he pulled my bicycle out of his precious car and he told me, Dan, you're going to do fine today, but just two things to remember. Keep pedaling and number two, don't hit my car. It's a big parking lot. I'm like, okay, not a problem. So keep pedaling and don't hit dad's car. Those are the two important things to remember as I'm learning to ride my bike. So he puts my helmet on my head, and we begin going down the road. He's running behind me, holding on to the seat, and he lets me go. And he's, you got it. Keep pedaling. Don't hit my car. So I keep pedaling. I keep pedaling. Well, I'm going the opposite direction of the car, and I start to think, I'm doing this. I'm riding the bike. Okay, what am I supposed to do? Pedal, pedal, pedal. Don't hit his car. Where's his car at? Where's his car? And I look back, and I see his car. I'm like, don't hit his car. And I I'm looking back, I began turning my bike back towards this car. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to hit his car. This is a huge parking lot, mind you. I'm thinking, keep pedaling, don't hit the car. Don't hit the car. Don't hit the car. Don't hit. And I go faster, faster, faster because I'm pedaling and I'm trying not to hit the car. My focus is so much on the car that bam, right into his door. Huge scratch down the car door and the big dent right where my helmet went right into the side of his door. So my dad comes running over as fast as he can, and he pushes me out of the way. He goes, my baby, my baby. I'm not scarred by that. I do feel loved, right? Loved and nurtured. The problem in this scenario and why I hit the car, it was a tiny car, huge parking lot. My focus was don't hit the car. Don't hit the car. There are a lot of us in this room that we struggle with sin, and our focus every day is don't sin. Don't sin. So we get up and we say, I'm not going to have a drink today. And and it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and we're thinking, I'm not going to drink today. Or or maybe it's pornography. Uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm thinking, I'm not going to look at those websites. I don't want those images in my head. And then, oh my gosh, they're in my head right now. How do I get those images out? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to focus on that. And we, we drive ourselves insane because we're going, uh, the very thing I'm trying not to do is the very thing I'm doing. It's like when I worked back in children's ministry, one of the illustrations we used to do with the kids, it worked so easily. If I asked you to close your eyes right now, everyone in the room, close your eyes. Do that with me? Okay, now don't think about an elephant. Okay, every one of you right now are thinking about an elephant. That's the way that works. You can open your eyes back up. There's no way that you could stop focusing on the thing you're focusing on if all you're doing is focusing on that thing. I know it sounds crazy and redundant, but the truth is what Paul is trying to say is you can't stop sinning by thinking about not sinning. You can't get control of your sinful nature by, by focusing on if, just don't sin today. In fact, it makes the pattern worse because 
our mind is focused on that sin. We see that Romans 8, 5 says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. We're spending our time focusing our mind on the things we shouldn't be. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. See, it's one of those struggles that I think every one of us in this room, we wish we could just say, you know, I wish there was some sort of like, Three-step program, some three-step message. If I do these three things, then I'm going to stop sinning. I'm going to be fine. But Paul's saying, no, it's just, it's nothing like that. It's just one simple principle. you got to focus on Jesus. That you gotta, you got to make intimacy with him so important, so much your focus, that everything else disappears. That as you focus on him, you're not, you're not even thinking about the other things. I, I happen to find this out on accident because several years ago as I started in ministry I started working in our children's ministry and it was such a beautiful time loved being back there with those kids wonderful kids and every week I would teach them something about God and they would come up and man don't you know if you teach kids stuff we got some children's workers right here they come up with some crazy questions so every week I, I would teach the kids something. They'd ask me some crazy questions that I didn't know how to answer. And then I would find myself on my knees before God going, God, I need to know more. I need to know more of you. I want to I understand. So tell me what to teach these kids. Tell me what songs we should be singing so they know how to worship you. Tell me, God, I want to be closer to you and I want these kids to learn. I don't want to fail at this. And, and it wasn't until a couple months later that all of a sudden I had a light bulb moment where I realized the sins that I used to struggle with and focus on daily were getting farther and farther and farther in my past. Why? Not because I was saying I'm not going to sin today, but because I was saying I've got to get into the presence of Jesus today. I want to know what he wants me to do today. I want to get closer to him. I want to understand him more. So guys, the answer to this problem of this battle with the end, it's not a three-step program. It's nothing like that. It's, it's that every day, we look to our Father and we say, how can I get closer to you, Jesus? You see, God will never lead us in to sin. He'll never lead us into temptation. He'll never lead us into some place that we can't handle. I remember when my girls were really little, we made some parenting mistakes where uh, I didn't even want to take them into public, you know, because we'd go into a store and they'd start grabbing stuff off the shelves. They're breaking things. They're pulling each other's hair and stuff like that. So it was just stressful to me. And there would be a lot of times I'd just wait in the car with the girls while Amelie would go in and shop because it wasn't worth the screaming match that would happen because we were parenting wrong. And the, what we were doing is we were going into the store and telling the girls everything they couldn't do. And we were teaching our girls how to live by saying, don't pull her hair, don't touch that, don't run down that aisle, stop screaming we're in a store, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And it wasn't working. One day, at a light bulb moment, that this isn't working, we've got to try it a different way. And I finally heard some parenting advice that, that blew my mind because it was exactly the opposite, where I heard a man say, Stop telling your kids what they can't do and start telling your kids who they are and what they can do. So we tried it a different way. And I remember the, the time we sat and had the little pep talk with the girls right out in the parking lot of Walmart. We said, okay, girls, you're hoopers. Kayla Hooper, you are a hooper. You have my name because you are my child. You're going to be just like me and mom in, a good, in all the good ways when you grow up. Rachel, same thing, you know. So I said, I'm going to teach you today how to be a hooper. So when we go into this store, I want you to do everything I do. In fact, you have freedom today. You can do whatever I do. In fact, if I walk down the aisle, I touch something, you can touch it. If I, if, I, if I go running through the store, you can run through the store. If I pull someone's hair, you can pull someone's hair. You can do whatever I do today. And they're like, Dad, that's awesome. And they came in the store and and they followed me around. They were looking for everything I did. And I'm walking real quietly. And they're like, we're walking quietly. Shh, shh. What did they do? They just kept looking at Daddy. I'm seeing what my dad does. And I'm just going to do what he does. Guys, life is so much more simple than we make it. 
We make life so difficult of you can't do this, you can't do that. This will make you fail. That will get you in a bad place. When God says what you got to do is look to your father, watch what he does, and do the same. So you start your day off going, well, Jesus, I, I, I want to know what you want me to do today. So where are you going? Like, are you lead me? So it's not a decision anymore of help me not get into trouble here. Help me not get into trouble here. I don't want to make this mistake today. It's Jesus, where are you going? I'm following you today. Are you going to love on someone today? You want me to pray for someone today? What do you want me to do? And when our focus comes on going, you know what? I, I'm going to start living to please the Spirit. Then our flesh gets starved. Do that day after day after day after day and you start to look back and you go, whoa, those things I used to struggle with, those addictions, those habits, guys, don't buy into the lie. Some of you in this room have bought into the lie. You've heard it's an addiction and people just have to deal with it. Something that runs in your family, you just have to deal with it. The Bible says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ and the power of Jesus Christ has freed us from sin that leads to death, okay? There is power in following Jesus. And all of a sudden you look back and you go, I, I haven't been doing that anymore. Why? Because you're focused. You're not focusing backwards. You're focused on Jesus. Where do you want me to go? We're about out of time, so I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And, and with no one looking around, I, I want to give an opportunity before we leave today because I know there are some people in this room, they're saying, you know what? I need to focus more on Jesus, stop focusing on sin. But there are some of you here that would say, this all sounds well and good, but I don't know who Jesus is. I hear you talk about him, but I don't know how to talk to him. I don't have a relationship with him. The Bible says very clearly that Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means every one of us in this room We've made mistakes, and we don't deserve to have a relationship with God. The Bible in Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Because we've sinned, we deserve to die. We deserve to be separate from God, but he gives us a free gift. And that's the eternal life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is how you get that free gift. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the day, dead, you will be saved. For it is your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So with no one looking around now, I say, why? Well, this is just so you can have some privacy, just you and God. If there's anyone in this room that has never started a relationship with Jesus, I want to pray for you here in a moment. So I'm going to count to three. And with no one looking around except for my eyes to pray for you, I'm going to ask you on the count of three to raise your hand so we can pray for you. Why do we do that? The Bible says that if we um, proclaim Jesus here on earth, he will proclaim us before the Father in heaven. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you, if you've never started a relationship with Jesus, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, so just raise your hand real quickly, look at me, and I'll let you put it back down. One, today could be your day. Jesus loves you. Two, three, would you raise your hand? Oh, I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. There's a number of hands that just went up in this room. People saying, you know what, I need to start a relationship with Jesus. Well, we're going to do that right now in this place. I'm going to ask every person in this room to repeat a prayer after me. And in this prayer, we're going to ask Jesus to forgive us for our sins. To make him the Lord and Savior of our life. To give us a home forever in heaven. So would you repeat this prayer after me? Every person in this room, so no one feels left out. Even if you prayed this prayer a hundred times, pray it with me right now. Dear Jesus... I am a sinner, and I need forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins, and I believe you rose again. So today, I ask you to be my Savior. Please give me a home forever in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For the couple of you back there that just raised your hand, would you put it up again so we can celebrate for you right now? I saw your hands. That's awesome. Praise God, man. Praise God. Praise God. Let me pray for you before we go. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. 
for those of us that struggle with sin, that struggle on the inside, we don't want to just keep looking back. So God, we pray that every day we would see where you go and we would follow. In the times we're tempted to go another direction, I pray that you would gently call to us and remind us where you're headed. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for every person in this room. Thank you that you love us and forgive us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's give him a shout of praise before we go today. He's good. Guys, I hope you have a wonderful week. We'll see you later on.